Hello, welcome to the channel. I'm speaking with David Shin, who is an adjunct professor of international affairs at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. During the Clinton administration, he served as US ambassador to Ethiopia from 1996 to 1999. David is also a frequent commentator in the international news media on political issues and has provided a consultancy to the US government on Horn of Africa related affairs. David has contributed passages to many publications relating to African affairs and continental relations with China. I'm pleased to have Ambassador Shin on the channel. Welcome. Thank you, George. I'd like to begin with the recent announcement made by the Biden administration regarding the implementation of potential sanctions on Ethiopia and Eritrea. After nearly a year of fighting in the Tigray region, a new executive order allows the US Treasury to sanction particular leaders and groups seen as fueling violence, including the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, the TPLF. Senior US officials hesitated to set a deadline for the ceasefire, but US officials who spoke on condition of anonymity to discuss White House strategy said that they were not optimistic that Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed would change course. The lack of action by the United States has been perceived by many, especially by the Tigrayan public, uh, as being reluctant to disturb the strategic relationship that the United States has with Ethiopia. In your view, why has the United States not been able to be more assertive and decisive in its foreign policy on the issue of Tigray? I think the United States has actually been fairly, um, fairly assertive, uh, not as much perhaps as some would like, but if you compare it especially to the actions of other nations within the European countries, some of whom have been active uh, in terms of uh, cutting back assistance to uh, Ethiopia, but uh, if you include other countries like China and Russia, not to mention uh, all of the develop, developing nations in the world, they've been basically uh, absent without leave. Uh, they haven't taken any position whatsoever uh, on the, the situation in Tigray. So the United States has been, relatively speaking, out in front. Uh, it's important to understand that this executive order that you're referring to concerning sanctions that uh, President Biden announced a couple of weeks ago, essentially lays the uh, legal framework for putting sanctions on primarily individuals or groups that are not uh, doing more to advance the cause of peace in Ethiopia. And as you rightly point out, it applies to Ethiopian officials, uh, Eritrean officials, and the TPLF. And in fact, uh, conceivably, it could have considerable impact on the TPLF if they too don't uh, participate in a process towards uh, achieving um, negotiation and a ceasefire and an end of the conflict, simply because there are significant numbers of uh, Tigrayans who live in the United States. And I suspect many of them, maybe most of them support the TPLF uh, and they could therefore put themselves in the harm's way when it comes to sanctions on individuals. And that applies equally to uh, uh, persons who support the Ethiopian government and the Eritrean government. Uh, but so far we have not seen any new sanctions actually imposed on anyone uh, the last sanction was against the chief of staff of the Eritrean military, which was a personal sanction uh, imposed by the United States. Uh, there have been some, there's been some holding back of uh, development aid to Ethiopia that was otherwise programmed to go forward. Uh, I suppose you could call that a sanction of sorts, but it essentially is postponing of, of assistance some assistance to Ethiopia. The United States remains the single largest provider of humanitarian aid to Ethiopia as of today. So that's sort of where the US stands with uh, the sanctions issue. And there will have to be progress in the uh, next week or so on bringing this conflict to an end, or I suspect the United States will start naming names and there will be people subject to sanctions. 
Has it been challenging for the U.S. government to focus its attention on the conflict in Tigray? I know that the Trump administration switched over uh, during the height of the crisis uh, to the Biden administration, and many other international conflicts have been occurring since that time, including the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the Armenia-Azerbaijani conflict, uh, as well as many others in Afghanistan as well. Do you think that the United States needs to, at the very least, put the issue of Tigray in its agenda? Well, you put your finger on a, on a major issue that always confronts American foreign policy, which uh, is a course I teach at George Washington University. And whenever you have significant numbers of other major world issues going on at the same time, it's going to detract from something like Tigray uh, or the conflict in Ethiopia, as serious as it may be. But quite frankly, the uh, situation in Afghanistan pretty much sucked the oxygen out of the air for a period of weeks. Uh, and there was very little attention to something as remote as, as Tigray when that is at its height. Uh, and even the ongoing long-standing issues of China U.S. relations or Russian U.S. relations, they're always consuming the energy uh, and the attention of senior levels of the administration, which, which makes it very hard uh, for them to focus on something like Tigray. I've actually been uh, astounded at how much high level attention there has been on the situation in Ethiopia by the Secretary of State, uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, by senior officials immediately below him, by the National Security Advisor, and even occasionally by President Biden himself. Uh, to me, it's, um, it's rather refreshing that they, they have given as much attention to the issue as they have. What do you think that the government needs to do to demonstrate to the concerned parties that the U.S. Foreign Service is able to use its resources to challenge the actions of the Ethiopian government and the Tigrayan forces? For instance, would referring the issue of the conflict to the Security Council help? Well, the United States, frankly, has already tried that, and it did not succeed, uh, mainly because China and Russia said, no, we're not, we don't want to bring up this issue in the Security Council. Uh, maybe they'll talk about humanitarian questions, but they don't want to bring up the political side of it. Uh, this is partly China's um, response to or its practice of not engaging in the internal affairs of other countries because it doesn't want other countries to engage in its internal affairs. So those two countries, and they're both permanent members of the Security Council, have said, no, we're, we're, not, we're not going to allow this to, to become a, a political issue in the Security Council. So it makes it hard um, as to where you try to do something about this. The US has been pushing very hard on the African Union to be more activist on um, the conflict in Ethiopia. That's a problem in part because the African Union has its headquarters in Addis Ababa, and I think finds it particularly difficult uh, to take action on anything concerning Ethiopia. Uh, not to mention the fact that the African Union has a pretty mixed record on dealing with internal African issues. Some I think it has been quite good at and, and very activist in trying to uh, resolve. Uh, the African Union was uh, leading, for example, and uh, trying to resolve the situation in Somalia. It uh, took the lead in Sudan and Darfur. Um, ultimately, it became a UN oper a combination, African Union, UN operation. Well, I give the African Union credit. They, they did take the lead there. Uh, other uh, issues in, um, in Africa, they have not uh, done so well. And in the case of Ethiopia, although the US is pushing them, to be more activist and, and to encourage a negotiation of all the parties involved in the dispute, it remains to be seen whether they're going to really seriously take this on or not. Well, the Biden administration recently appointed Jeffrey Feltman as the US Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa. He has had some considerable engagement with Prime Minister Abiy and other officials in the Ethiopian government. How do you perceive his work being uh, done as a fundamental aspect of the conflict resolution? 
Well, first, it's another indication of the degree of seriousness to which the Biden administration takes the conflict in, uh, in Ethiopia, the, the mere um, naming of a special American envoy for the Horn of Africa, whose primary mandate is to deal with the situation in Ethiopia is, I think, a positive sign in terms of what the administration is trying to do. And as you say, he has had a couple of visits to Ethiopia. He's had high-level meetings. Uh, I, I think some of those meetings have been fairly productive. I'm not privy to what, uh, what goes on in those meetings, so it's hard for me to say. Uh, as we are speaking uh, right now, he is in Sudan uh, dealing with a somewhat related issue in Sudan, that is the democratization process uh, in Sudan. Of course, there are links between Sudan and Ethiopia and the Tigray dispute also. And I suspect those are getting some discussion uh, by Ambassador Feltman. Uh, I don't know whether he's going on to Ethiopia on this trip or not. I wouldn't be too surprised if he shows up in Ethiopia uh, after Sudan, but I've not heard that that is part of uh, his travel plan. Uh, in any event, uh, the fact that he is deeply engaged in um, trying to resolve the, the situation in Ethiopia is a good thing. I think he's had some limited success. There's a long way to go. And I think all American officials uh, who have interacted with, uh, with the Ethiopian interlocutors have felt somewhat frustrated. Uh, they have not gotten as far as they would like on either encouraging a negotiation process or improving the humanitarian situation in Tigray, which continues to be bad and also is expanding into other areas now into Amhara region and, and a very small part of Afar region uh, because the TPLF has moved into those areas and, and basically extended the, uh, the conflict. Um, I've been saying since that expansion began that the, um, the Tigrayan Defense Forces, the TPLF would be better advised to pull back into Tigray and deal with the issues in Tigray and not go into Amhara and Afar regions. I think that, I believe that's a mistake, quite frankly. Some Ethiopians, although I cannot speak for them, claim that the US government is acting hostile towards the Ethiopian government in light of the conflict occurring in Tigray. Institutions such as the State Department, USAID, and other American federal agencies responding to the humanitarian situation in particular have been accused of being supportive of the TPLF forces. What do you make of these comments and are there any legitimate criticisms to note in the way that the US is handling the situation? Well, first off, acknowledging that there are mistakes can always be made by government officials or others. And, and I'm not suggesting that US diplomacy has been perfect, uh, but uh, I would say, and, and you as a person from your region would I think understand this, my experience with Ethiopians and Eritreans uh, from the highland areas, particularly more so than those from the lowlands, tend to take the position that you're 100% for us or you're 100% against us. And there isn't really much middle ground. If you don't completely support us, then you must oppose us. And goodness knows I encountered that in 1998 when the conflict broke out with Eritrea. And I was constantly being barraged with criticism from the, uh, the EPRDF uh, officials at the time that, well, you're not supporting us 100%. That means you must be supporting the Eritreans. And I know that our ambassador in Eritrea ran into the same problem. Uh, if uh, the Eritrean government was accusing him of, you don't want 100% support us, you must be favoring the Ethiopians. It's a no-win situation uh, for, for an outside group. And I would argue it's more of a cultural issue than anything else. Now, to some extent, I think all societies feel that way. There's an element of this uh, pretty much uh, around the world. But I felt it more in the Ethiopian highlands and the Eritrean highlands than any other uh, location that I've ever served in. And I've spent a lot of time in, in Africa and a fair amount in the Middle East. And I've never quite seen the degree to which uh, 
the local folks think you've got to support us 100%. And if you don't, then you must be our enemy. A topic that I would like to discuss more in detail later in our conversation, but I think is relevant to the context of our current uh, topic is misinformation. How is the US dealing with propaganda on both sides? Did the telecommunications blackout caused by the Ethiopian government early on in November contribute to the additional issue of an appropriate response? Well, the, the blackout uh, contributed to an enormous increase in misinformation coming out of Tigray. There's no doubt about that. Uh, misinformation has been a big part of this dispute on, on both sides, I would argue, although uh, certainly initially it was more on the side of the Ethiopian government, I think, than it was on the, on the Tigrayan side. Now it, it's somewhat more equalized and that the TPLF has more access uh, to the outside world than it had initially. So there's, there's an enormous amount of misinformation. All you have to do is look at the uh, Ethiopian diaspora communications. And if you want misinformation, there are gobs of it there uh, on both sides. And it's, it's really unfortunate, it's unhelpful. Uh, it doesn't do anyone any good to rely upon the misinformation that's floating around. Uh, some of it is, um, is caused by people from the area. Some of it's caused by outside analysts. Um, I'm sure I've made some mistakes over the last um, several months in commenting on things where I get things wrong occasionally. I'm not there on the ground. I'm not able to judge with my own eyes exactly what is going on. I'm trying to weigh the best reports, uh, what I consider to be the most accurate, accurate reports coming out of the region and dismiss all of those that I think are nonsense. And sometimes you get it wrong. You, know, you just don't have the best information, but it's a serious problem. Uh, and it's been exacerbated because it's been uh, uh, also influenced by a certain amount of, of hate uh, speech. Uh, by, again, by, by all sides. And that the hate speech is mainly based on ethnic um, lines, uh, ethnic statements. And, and that is particularly uh, unfortunate in my view. I've seen a little less of that uh, in recent weeks, perhaps, than I saw earlier, but it still is hanging around and it, it's not helpful. Is that affecting the US policy response uh, on the conflict in Tigray? I think to a degree it is because they, of course, see the misinformation um, together with information that they consider uh, uh, valid and unbelievable. And, and sometimes the U.S. government will, as I have, trouble in sorting out fact from fiction. You'll occasionally get it wrong or you'll, you will occasionally err on, on one side of an issue or another. Uh, I think the U.S. government has access to a lot of other information. I don't have access to, and uh, for that matter, the diaspora does not have access to. Uh, and I'm sure they're, um, to the extent they think that information is accurate, they're relying heavily on it. But all of us are um, at the mercy of uh, the information that we do have access to, and it's not perfect. So we're all making some decisions that um, are going to occasionally be flawed. During the course of the conflict, the humanitarian crisis that has enveloped uh, the region has created controversy. The grand forces were accused of looting trucks in order to bring necessary items to their fighters, while Ethiopian forces were accused of blocking passageways into Tigray. What sources should the public be looking for for updates on the humanitarian crisis in Tigray? Uh, for instance, the international aid organizations or foreign diplomats who have visited Ethiopia in the past. Yeah, in my view, the most reliable reports on anything concerning the humanitarian situation in, um, in Tigray, uh, the best reports come from the international aid organizations, international NGOs, international humanitarian organizations. And I rely much more heavily on them than I do from anything coming from either the TPLF or the government of Ethiopia. Uh, again, they're going to make some mistakes, and we're going to get some things uh, that will be somewhat biased. But uh, 
I think that uh, day after day, their information has proven to be the most reliable. I also pay a fair amount of attention to the uh, human rights organizations, including the Ethiopian human rights organizations. They've done some uh, fairly good reporting on at least several of the incidents that have taken place in Tigray, which tends to, score, to correspond with which um, with the information coming out of uh, Amnesty International or coming out of uh, the United Nations humanitarian organization or out of Human Rights Watch, all of those reports tend to be more or less uh, similar. The details may vary, but uh, I do read very carefully anything that comes out of one of the um, Ethiopian human rights organizations. One of the most important aspects of the conflict in Tigray has been the involvement of the Eritrean military. The Ethiopian and Eritrean governments both initially denied the presence of Eritrean troops in Tigray for months. And when Prime Minister Abiy later admitted that Eritrean troops were in Tigray, the justification used was that the TPLF incursion on the Northern Command in November somehow posed a threat to Eritrea. And Eritrean troops were stationed along the border to guard the country after TPLF fired missiles into Asmara, the capital city. Of course, satellite imagery shows that Eritrean troops were in Humera five days before the attack. There is some speculation that in the months leading up to the war, President Isaias and Prime Minister Abiy met frequently to discuss a possible military agreement between the two countries. What has been your opinion about the role of Eritrean troops in Tigray? Is it disturbing to see that the Eritrean troops destroyed refugee camps, forcibly repatriated refugees, and have committed extrajudicial killing of civilians? Yeah, it's very disturbing. And I think the evidence is pretty firm uh, in terms of what Eritrean forces uh, did in Tigray uh, and perhaps are still doing to some extent, although their presence seems to be considerably diminished at this point. Uh, some of the worst atrocities in Tigray are attributed by international uh, observers on the ground in Tigray to the Tigrayan forces. Uh, certainly the obliteration of two Eritrean refugee camps was at the hands of Eritrean forces and the forcible return to Eritrea of some unknown number of, of Eritreans who had who had fled uh, Eritrea some time ago, uh, all at the hands of, uh, of Eritrea. And I, my own view is that the, uh, the goal of, uh, of the Eritrean forces is very clear. It's to eliminate the TPLF. The TPLF is, see, is seen as an enemy, and their goal is to try to ensure its obliteration. And they were more than happy to go in and um, send American or send uh, Eritrean troops in in order to carry out that function uh, at the, uh, if not at the, the request of the Ethiopian government, uh, certainly with the complete agreement of the Ethiopian government. And to me, that was one of the most hypocritical developments to occur in this entire conflict. Uh, particularly as someone who was in Ethiopia at the outbreak of the conflict in 1998 between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and listening to all of the Ethiopian complaints at that time about the Eritrean uh, activities along the border. Uh, and again, there might be some, some blame on both sides uh, in that conflict, but uh, there was just unanimous criticism of the Eritrean uh, presence along the border in the 1998 uh, to 2000 timeframe. And now you bring it up to the present time and you have the Ethiopian forces uh, inviting the Eritrean forces into Tigray uh, to help them do their dirty work for them. Well, the Ethiopian government over time has insisted on the United States to stop meddling in internal affairs of Ethiopia while allowing Eritrean government forces to fully operate in a foreign war against Ethiopians and lying about it to the international community. How problematic is this conflict to, to the interest of other countries in the region, such as Sudan, 
who feel that the sudden refugee influxes are a burden on its fragile domestic situation. You know, I'm not sure what the impact is going to be on Sudan. Uh, now, in all fairness, Ethiopia has every right to invite Eritrean forces into Ethiopia if it so desires. And it obviously desired to do that, and it invited them in. So I'm not saying that it's illegal or that it's, it's, it's technically wrong. It's not. Um, it's horribly hypocritical, in my view, to do so. And I think that um, the Ethiopian government at some point in the future is going to have to explain to its people um, why they did this and what was the purpose of it. Uh, they thought they could get away with simply denying that they were there for several months. And that became impossible uh, to deny any longer. And they had to acknowledge that they, uh, they had been invited into the country. But uh, it's not illegal. and. Um, as I say, uh, Eritrea had its own reasons for going in. Uh, I have no idea what Eritrea thinks today about sending forces into Ethiopia, whether it thought that was a great idea or not. Um, they certainly have a, a long-standing enemy now in terms of the TPLF, uh, which is conceivably going to uh, be a, a thorn in their side for a long time to come. As far as the impact on Sudan, it, um, it may not have any significant uh, impact there. I've actually been sort of pleasantly surprised at the relative small number of refugees who have gone from Ethiopia into Sudan. I realize in part that the uh, Ethiopian uh, forces have effectively sealed off the border between Western Tigray and um, and Sudan, so it would be very hard for any more Tigrayans to go into um, Sudan. The numbers might be a lot higher if that border were open. And that's really the only border where they could enter Sudan. Um, as far as er the Eritrean Sudan border is concerned, it, as far as I know, it doesn't seem to have much, have had much impact upon movement or migration from Eritrea into Sudan, but maybe there's something going on there that I'm just not aware of. In an address made to the media in March, Prime Minister Abiy said that Eritrea would withdraw its forces from Tigray immediately, but no evidence that a veri verifiable withdrawal has been shown to this day. Is it likely that the alliance made between the Ethiopian and Eritrean governments in this military campaign was conditional? I ask that because the relations between the two countries changed dramatically after Prime Minister Abiy became uh, the leader of the country. Where do the relations between Ethiopia and the US go if Eritrea insists on continuing the fight against the Tigrayan forces? Uh, again, it's going to depend a lot upon where it appears the blame lies for continuing the conflict. And if, it's, if it looks like it's shared blame, uh, in other words, uh, Tigrayan forces stay inside the Amhara region and inside Afar region, it's going to be much more difficult in my view for the Tigrayans to gain uh, sympathy or support from the United States or, or indeed other countries. If, they, if the Tigrayans were to confine their efforts inside Tigray, I think they would find themselves in a stronger position to gain international support, particularly if Eritrean forces were to remain inside Tigray. I don't know what the status is at the moment on, on, on numbers of, of uh, Eritreans inside Tigray. My impression was that the Tigrayans, uh, by taking control of Southern and Central Tigray, but not Western Tigray, uh, effectively pushed the Eritreans, uh, if not out of much of Tigray, at least push them really close to the border area and therefore reduce their, their presence in Tigray. Uh, but I'm, I'm not in a position to judge uh, how many Eritrean troops there are in Tigray today. The sanctions imposed on Ethiopia by the United States claims that the conflict is a national security threat. The statement I'm referring to claims that the Tigray crisis is a national security threat to the US. 
Could you explain how the increase in violence could endanger U.S. interests? Is it the rise yeah. of extremism or China's growing influence near the Red Sea? That's a good question, and I, I wish I could, but I, I'm a little hard pressed to understand why this is a, a national security threat uh, for the United States itself. It certainly is in the interest of the United States to have peace and stability in the Horn of Africa. There's no doubt about that. Uh, whether that constitute, whether lack of, of peace uh, and stability in the Horn of Africa constitutes a national security threat to the United States, I think is highly debatable. Uh, I would be inclined to say that it does not. Uh, what I don't know is whether there's sort of something about the legal language in an executive order that kind of requires you to assert a national security threat before you issue the executive order. And I was not aware that there was any such requirement, but maybe there's something going on legally here that I'm just not aware of. And, and it has a, a very simple explanation that has never been clear to me. But that language uh, immediately struck me as unusual when I read it. I, uh, I was surprised by it. The protest in the United States and other Western nations by the Ethiopian diaspora population over the conflict shows a split between Ethiopian government supporters and the ethnic Tigrayan uh, supporters and also Tigrayans in general who both want Western civic engagement in order to achieve their interests. Is that pressure at all contributing to the hesitancy of the US to act, seeing a risk that it could upset part of its constituency? Um, probably does to some extent. Uh, it probably has more impact on um, members of Congress than it does on the executive branch because they're going to be subject to the, the whims of the, whatever the strongest diaspora is in their state or in their legislative district. So I think it will play out to a larger extent there. Uh, there obviously are more non tigrayans than Tigrayans in the United States. Uh, so that probably works to the advantage of, um, of the Ethiopian government. But there are also uh, significant numbers of Oromo who are not happy with um, the way that the, um, the Ethiopian government is uh, running affairs in the state. So you, you have something of a marriage of convenience going on between, for example, the Oromo Liberation Front and the Tigrayan Defense Forces and, and other Oromo who, for whatever reason, uh, just don't go along with the Abiy um, Ahmed government. So it, it's not a question of Tigrayans versus non-Tigrayans. There are others out there who, who find themselves on different sides of the, uh, of the argument. And for that matter, there are probably a few Tigrayans who are supportive of the government, uh, the Abiy Ahmed position. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to judge where everyone is coming from. And I have not seen uh, that much involvement in, uh, in terms of protests by the uh, Ethiopian diaspora in the United States. Part of that's probably due to COVID and a reluctance to have uh, big gatherings. Uh, and even if you had a big gathering, where do you, where do you hold it these days? There's almost nobody at the State Department. So going down to the US State Department and protesting, it's kind of a waste of time. You're yelling at, uh, at empty uh, offices for the most part. Uh, I suppose you could go to Capitol Hill and, and do your protesting somewhere there. But I haven't seen that much uh, by way of protests uh, so far. What lessons do you draw from your time as ambassador to Ethiopia to engage positively with the Ethiopian population in the US. Do you consult with Ethiopians to get a better idea of the political and social nuance of the country and to get a holistic understanding of the deep-seated issues? Well, certainly when I served as ambassador, I did that. And when I, when I served as director for East African Affairs, which included all of the Horn of Africa uh, before going out to Ethiopia, uh, I also made every effort I could to consult with um, uh, not only Ethiopians, but other government officials and, and uh, individual private citizens, business people, political opposition elements, et cetera, uh, throughout the Horn of Africa. 
Uh, well, I consider that to be a very important part of, um, of the job of someone in the State Department. I'm sure that Jeffrey Feltman, the current uh, Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, is doing the same thing. I know he's meeting with a large variety of, of people when he goes to a, a place like uh, Sudan or Ethiopia. Uh, when I served in, in Ethiopia as ambassador, I made a special point of, of constantly traveling around the country. My policy was that uh, out of every month, I would be traveling somewhere in Ethiopia outside of Addis Ababa. And I held to that for three years. Um, so as a result, I was crisscrossing uh, Ethiopia constantly. And there were very few zones, administrative zones in Ethiopia that I did not visit. In fact, the only ones that I did not visit were five zones in Somali region uh, that the government would not let me visit because of insecurity at the time that I was serving there. Uh, there was a certain amount of uh, IED activity and, and uh, ONLF activity uh, aimed at the government and the government didn't feel comfortable in letting me travel there. Uh, but other than that, I, I constantly was uh, traveling around Ethiopia, and I thought that was the most productive use of my time uh, to go out, visit these areas, talk with a wide variety of people, not just the local government officials, but religious leaders and uh, business people, uh, educators, uh, if there were universities in the towns. Um, opposition groups or, or members, uh, you know, anyone and everyone that would speak to me, basically. And uh, it was exceedingly helpful to me to find out what they were up to. Uh, sometimes I would come back to Addis Ababa and I would feel that I had a better understanding of what was going on in the country than some of the government officials who were, who were in Addis Ababa. Well, I want to return back to the topic of misinformation. It's used as a tool to enhance propaganda and of course has been a phenomenon that has existed throughout the history of Ethiopia and other countries with many world issues centering around the focus of trying to combat misinformation. The conflict in Tigray between ethnic groups is essentially uh, since June uh, when the Tigrayan forces recaptured the regional capital of Mekele and the expansion of their forces into Amhara and Afar region has added an additional complexity into the conflict, which is that the competing narratives of what's happening is shaping the perception of what's uh, going on in the country. But there's also another aspect of this that I want to highlight and would like to ask you, how important is the role of social media in the conflict? Do you think that influences uh, the perception of American policy by Ethiopians in any way? Uh, I think it has a greater impact upon influencing uh, diaspora opinion than it does either U.S. government opinion or, for that matter, Ethiopian government opinion. Uh, it inevitably will have some impact on that. Uh, social media can be very useful, but because there's so much misinformation on the social media, my own view is it probably does about as much damage as it does good. Uh, it's, it's a good medium for getting information spread quickly. But when that information is uh, inaccurate, then it, it does a lot of harm. And I, I have seen uh, social media do a great deal of harm in terms of the Ethiopian conflict. So I, um, I would like to see a lot less of it, quite frankly, uh, used in a situation like the Ethiopian conflict. Many Ethiopian news sources are conflating the issues that the U.S. addresses in its statements on the conflict with criticism of the country in general, which seems to distract the general public about the seriousness of the crisis in Tigray. Why do you think the media in Ethiopia tends to dismiss anything that the U.S. is saying as irrelevant or not appropriate? Well, you don't have what I would call a completely free press in, in Ethiopia today, or for that matter, there's a lot of a lot of the developing world where you don't have a free press. To me, the, the free press is one of the most important aspects of a democratic uh, government. And Ethiopia has never been strong on a free press. I mean, literally never. 
um, it, it's always had issues with the government uh, exerting a certain amount of control over the press that varies somewhat from, from uh, year to year, but it was never very open during my time there, or for that matter, throughout the period of the EPRDF. Uh, it looked, it, it did get better uh, right after Abiy Ahmed uh, took control of, of the country. And I was very hopeful that uh, you would have a relatively free press in Ethiopia under um, uh, Abiy Ahmed. But there's been slippage, I think, uh, more recently. And certainly in the case of Tigray, there has been serious slippage. Uh, it still may be a little better than it was during the EPRDF period, but uh, it's far from ideal today. And as long as the government is essentially controlling the media, or at least uh, preventing it from really speaking freely, uh, it's going to do what it thinks the government wants it to do, or it will be shut down. It's just that simple. So if the government wants it to be critical of the US, it'll be critical. And there's no way, I don't know of any way the US can change it. One aspect of the conflict earlier in November, which was especially important, was the blockage of humanitarian aid, the telecommunication and electricity blackouts, and the restriction of journalists from entering the region. What impact did that have in the early days of the conflict? And are these things that the Ethiopian government intentionally wanted to keep secret so as to not create panic? Uh, I think it had a major impact upon how the uh, situation was perceived by the outside world uh, in Tigray. The, there was an enormous amount of misinformation coming out of Tigray at that time. And again, repeating a statement I made earlier, to the extent that I relied upon uh, reports uh, from Tigray, I relied primarily on those relatively few reports from the international humanitarian and aid agencies, you did finally start to get some um, of the international press into uh, Tigray. And some of those people I know by reputation, and I tended to rely more heavily upon what they wrote. They tended to be somewhat critical of, of uh, the government of Ethiopia. Uh, the government was not happy with a lot of what they were saying. But I think the, the international press was trying for the most part to get it right. And I put a fair amount of stock in what they were writing, uh, but still it was an imperfect imperf world and there were major chunks of Tigray that no one was still getting to. Uh, when you look particularly at the, uh, the reports of vehicles being blocked from getting into Tigray or the inability to deliver food to various parts of Tigray, by the international aid organizations, uh, I relied primarily upon what the international aid organizations were saying and writing, uh, or the UN. Uh, the UN had people in there also. And they pretty uniformly uh, put the blame on the government of Ethiopia for, for blockading or, or preventing more trucks from getting in. Some trucks were allowed in. It wasn't a total blockade by any means. Uh, there was an interesting report that recently came out indicating that uh, 400 and 480 some trucks have gone in to Tigray uh, in the last two months up until about the middle of September. And don't quote me on the precise number, but something like uh, 70 or 80 have returned to uh, Addis Ababa, which means a whole bunch of trucks are now stuck in Tigray, and that raises the question, why are the trucks stuck in Tigray? Uh, it would not be the government of Ethiopia, presumably that was keeping them in Tigray because it's not in most of Tigray today. Uh, what apparently is happening is two things. One, lack of fuel in Tigray, so the trucks can't make it back because they don't have enough diesel or gasoline to get back, and two, Turns out that most of the drivers are Tigrayan, and the Tigrayan drivers would rather just stay in Tigray. Thank you. Uh, they're not interested in driving the trucks back to uh, 
uh, to the rest of Ethiopia. So it's a, it's kind of an interesting development, and it's it's a, a problem. I don't know how you solve that problem. You get more fuel in the Tigray for one, but what do you do with drivers who are not willing to drive the trucks back? Well, I'd like to switch uh, the topic of our conversation to a research interest that you've had for a while, which is the Chinese influence in Africa. China's role in the Horn of Africa, in more uh, particular terms, is of serious importance to note. The Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lingjian said that, quote, we oppose the wanton extortion of pressure through sanctions or the threat of imposing sanctions to interfere in other countries' internal affairs, referring, of course, to the U.S. executive order. This is following the general anti-imperial notion that the West should not be at all involved in conflicts which it sees as impending Chinese interests. In addition to Russia's anti-Western stance and non-interference approach to foreign policy in Ethiopia, what is China's ultimate goal in advocating for Ethiopian interests? Is it to demonstrate that China is a superior international partner for African nations, or is it that it's taking part of advanced Chinese interests by securing Ethiopia's trust? Well, I think it's, it's both of those and more. Um, by way of background, let me just say that China's uh, normal position is to oppose sanctions. That virtually every case I know of, maybe one or two exceptions, they have come out in opposition to sanctions. So that's uh, the standard procedure for them. Um, in, in this case, uh, they, I think, particularly enjoy opposing sanctions because that puts the United States in a difficult position in Ethiopia, since uh, the government of Ethiopia also is totally opposed to the concept of sanctions, and it's a way for China to ingratiate itself with the Ethiopian government. But China is also very opportunistic uh, when it comes to Ethiopia. China had a very close relationship with the TPLF. Uh, during the EPRDF. They had a close relationship with the EPRDF, but as we all know, the TPLF was the lead actor. It was the primary force in the EPRDF. And China's relationship was exceedingly close uh, to the EPRDF. Well, the EPRDF gets basically abolished, uh, replaced by the uh, Prosperity Party, and, and the TPLF um, removes itself to Tigray, taking... Um, the EPRDF out of the equation. So China's casting around trying to figure out uh, how, does it, uh, how does it deal with this new government in Addis Ababa? Uh, and it has made a major effort to uh, shore up a, a good relationship with Abiy Ahmed, hopefully at the same time, not alienating itself from the TPLF. Now that will be hard to do both of those. Uh, I think for the time being, it sees its uh, position its, its role in establishing a good relationship with the Pros Prosperity Party and the, uh, the Abiy Ahmed government is more important than maintaining a position with the TPLF. So that's where it's putting most of its uh, effort for the time being. But I can assure you, if for some reason tomorrow, uh, the Prosperity Party were to fall and the, the TPLF is in total control in Tigray, uh, uh, and you have some new regime in Addis Ababa, China would very quickly work to establish a good relationship with that regime, whatever it happened to be. Um, but for the time being, uh, the effort is to, to shore up its relationship with, with Abiy Ahmed. Russia is also opportunistic in this regard. Uh, Russia too tends to um, be opposed to sanctions. Um, there may be a few exceptions to that, but Generally, they oppose sanctions. Uh, China sees this as an opportunity to improve its relationship with the Abiy Ahmed government, uh, to sort of poke its finger in the eye of the United States, and uh, to hopefully uh, consolidate its position throughout the Horn of Africa. Uh, time will tell whether this is a wise policy or not. Well, it seems like the policy position that you were describing with Chinese influence in Ethiopia is similar to how the Mengistu-led Derg regime sided with the Soviet Union after he was not able to procure military armaments from the U.S., which subsequently left Somalia joining with the U.S. in the Horn of Africa during the Cold War period. Uh, are these dynamics 
important for the development of the Horn of Africa? Is it safe for allegiances to be switching this quickly? Well, unfortunately, they're a fact of life. And, and uh, you, you point out the, uh, the switching that went on uh, between the Soviet Union and the United States and the Horn of Africa back in the, uh, in the Mengistu days. And you're quite right. The United States was a very uh, strong ally of Haile Selassie until he was overthrown in 1974. Uh, and the Mengistu replacement regime fairly quickly turned to the Soviet Union because it was not satisfied with the armament it was getting from the United States. Uh, I think the Soviet Union thought that that would uh, that it could still maintain a good relationship with Somalia at the same time. I think it miscalculated there. It didn't understand that you can't have really close relations with Ethiopia and Somalia at the same time, particularly when they're at war with each other. Uh, so the United States ended up flipping its uh, uh, allegiance to Somalia, and the Soviet Union uh, was uh, very close to Ethiopia. And that pretty much continued until the, um, the end of the Mengistu government, a year or two before it fell, uh, and also the Soviet Union came undone. And then you had a complete change of, of, uh, of actors uh, in the Horn of Africa, and the United States uh, reasserted a, a fairly strong relationship with the um, in the Melis uh, Zanawi government uh, in, uh, in Ethiopia in 1991. Uh, this, the Russia, Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, kind of bowed out for oh, at least 10 years and wasn't doing much in the, in the region, maybe longer than that, um, until it has been reasserting itself more recently. But China has been very active in uh, Ethiopia certainly going all the way back to the 1990s and during the time that I served in Ethiopia and has become far more assertive in the 21st century than during the time that I was there. I think China has played generally a smarter game uh, in the Horn of Africa than Russia has. Well, are the agendas of China and the U.S. different uh, when it comes to Africa? Are the two superpowers naturally opposed to one another due to their developmental capacity? Uh, there, there are clear areas of competition between China and the United States, but there also are potential areas for collaboration. And there, they've actually been exercised to some degree in the past. Both China and the United States would like to see political stability throughout Africa. It's in their interest to have it. Now, we may disagree tactically on how to achieve it. U.S. is imposing uh, sanctions and in Ethiopia, China opposes sanctions. That's a tactical difference. Uh, but the goal is political stability in Ethiopia by both sides. Both countries want development, economic development, and both support it uh, throughout Africa. Uh, again, the tactics are slightly different, but not that different. Um, so those are two big areas of potential collaboration. Uh, both countries opposed Somali piracy and worked together to knock down Somali piracy. Both opposed terrorism in the region. And there has been some very modest collaboration uh, to deal with, with terrorism in the region. Uh, on the other hand, there's, there's the obvious commercial competition, economic competition. Uh, but that's true for the United States and Germany, just as it is for the United States and China. Uh, that's not unique to China. Uh, there are philosophical differences in terms of how do we see the future of these countries. The United States would like to see them evolve as uh, sort, of, sort of Western style democracies or something close to that. Uh, whereas China's view of the political future of the region is, I think, far more authoritarian. Uh, it's certainly not Western style liberal, liberal democracy. And that's the single biggest difference that the U.S. has with China in Africa. Well, of course, the African Union headquarters are in Addis Ababa, and they were funded and built mainly by the Chinese. Does the ruling party in China recognize the continent as a potential market for military and trade? Uh, should it continue to engage with significant African countries such as Ethiopia? 
Uh, certainly China is doing that, and China is a, a major arms supplier for Africa, uh, both conventional arms and small arms and light weapons. Interestingly, Russia is the number one uh, provider of arms to Africa, mainly because Russia sells so much to North Africa. North Africa buys many, many more times of uh, armament than all of Sub-Saharan Africa does, and Russia is the primary provider. When you get to Sub-Saharan Africa, Russia and China are about tied in terms of the percentage of arms that they provide. Most of it sales. These, these are not freebies. Uh, this is a way both countries make money. And in all fairness, the United States is a major provider of arms to North Africa, not to Sub-Saharan Africa, but primarily to Egypt and uh, Morocco. And it's a significant amount, so we're a major provider to North Africa. Uh, in any event, um, China will continue to do this. It sees um, arms transfers as part of its foreign policy. Uh, its arms transfers to Africa in the last several years have actually declined uh, from going back to about 2016, I think was the high point, and they've come down significantly since 2016. I don't have a good explanation for that, uh, but China will remain an important supplier of arms to Africa, and so will Russia. I mean, Russia has um, produced so many arms over the years. They're good at it. The arms are relatively inexpensive, and that's one of the ways they make money. One of the goals that Prime Minister Abe has with President Isaiah and their military and political agreements is a closer collaboration of the two countries working together. And some in the Ethiopian diaspora see that the port of Asab is a good way for Ethiopia to expand its interests, especially in trade. Would that also influence Chinese to be more involved in the Red Sea Basin? I know that China has a overseas military base in Djibouti. Would the conflict of interest between Ethiopia and Somaliland, for instance, rise up uh, should uh, the conflict of uh, national security be a risk for uh, Chinese or American investment uh, due to uh, military needs? Now, I doubt that Assad has much impact upon China's thinking uh, at this juncture. Uh, as you say, they have a major military base in Djibouti. Uh, they don't need and probably don't want another military base so close by. Um, there, I can't imagine what the uh, rationale would be for having a military base in both Assab and Djibouti, unless they were pushed out of Djibouti. That's, you know, that's another issue entirely. But um, for the time being, I, I think uh, China um, doesn't see that much interest per se in Eritrea. And there's, I think it has bigger fish to fry at, at this point in time. They're, they're definitely interested in the Red Sea. They want to have a collaborative relationship with Eritrea. They probably want to have access to uh, ports and Masawa and Asab uh, for, for um, PLA Navy ships, should they uh, be required to call there for some reason. But a military base, I don't really see the, uh, the reason for it. And, and I, I don't think it's going to have much impact upon their thinking. Well, in closing, I want to discuss the future of Ethiopia, especially in the context of the conflict in Tigray. As it is a regional ally to many, including the US, as a partner for security and counterterrorism, Ethiopia's internal affairs seem to have had external effects. For instance, the former peacekeeping troops stationed in Somalia have been withdrawn to help the federal forces fight in Tigray, which preceded US withdrawal from Somalia after President Trump left office. What are some of the realistic consequences of Ethiopia's continuing decline if it does not reach a settlement? Now, on, on a factual basis, um, I know that some Ethiopian troops have left um, Somalia. I don't know if all of them have left. Now, maybe you have seen something that, that I haven't seen, and, and perhaps you're correct. Perhaps they all have left. But I thought that there were still some Ethiopian troops um, uh, in Somalia. In any event, uh, the fact that some of them left is an important statement in and of itself. And it suggests a, um, 
a rethinking of uh, Ethiopian support for the African Union operation in Somalia. Uh, and if, if only some of them left, it still makes it easier in, in theory for Al-Shabaab to uh, perhaps go into territory that was previously held by Ethiopian troops. So it does weaken the, the Somali uh, government position in the country. Uh, and the whole African Union uh, operation in, in Somalia is under a certain amount of pressure anyway. Uh, you also have had some interesting things going on between Eritrea and the Somali uh, central government. Uh, there's been, as I understand it, a fair amount of training of Somali forces in Eritrea. And there were even reports at the very beginning of the Tigrayan conflict of Somali forces in Tigray. Uh, those may very well have been, assuming the report is true, and I'm inclined to think that it is, those may have been uh, Somali troops that were being trained in Eritrea. Uh, and you have had in recent weeks in Somalia, a uh, discussion, a um, disagreement, if you will, as to whatever happened to those troops that went to uh, Eritrea, because they, I gather, most of them have not returned to Somalia. At least that's what their relatives are saying. I don't know what the numbers are. I don't know whether they have or have not returned, uh, although uh, relatives are saying that at least some of them have not. But there are a lot of questions going on here uh, as to what the impact is going to be on Somalia and what the Eritrean role is in all of this. Is the conflict in Tigray exacerbating the divides that have already existed in Ethiopia? What does it mean for the future of the country and for the region? Well, there's no doubt that what the, uh, the situation in Tigray has exacerbated the ethnic divide in, uh, in Ethiopia. In fact, my, my fear has been that it has highlighted um, a desire by a lot of Tigrayans to secede from Ethiopia. And I think personally, that would be a big mistake. I, I oppose uh, that, uh, that motive. I, I hope that the Tigrayans don't do that. But I know that there are Tigrayans who very much want to secede from, um, from, the, from the rest of Ethiopia. And my fear is that it would lead to secession of other parts of Ethiopia and, and conceivably uh, you know, the effective breakup of the country. And what you would have would be a series of relatively small landlocked and very poor countries. And that is not a recipe for stability in the Horn of Africa. And in my view, that is not in the interest of the United States. Now, obviously it's up to Tigrayans to decide their own future and Ethiopians more generally to decide their, their future. But um, I hope it doesn't go that route. But clearly the uh, conflict in Tigray has set these things in motion. You penned an open letter with three other former US ambassadors to Ethiopia about the conflict early on. And in it, you expressed your concern that the crisis would get worse over time. Since the writing of the letter, what has been your reflection about the crisis in Tigray? Well, it's gotten worse pretty clearly and um, not necessarily the way I would have thought. Uh, I was surprised that the Tigrayan Defense Forces were able to uh, remove from central and uh, southern uh, uh, Tigray so quickly the Ethiopian government forces and apparently the, uh, the Eritrean forces. I, I never would have predicted that. Um, I, I thought it was going to be a long standing guerrilla type warfare in which there would never be a winner, never be a military winner. They may, they, there may still never be a military winner, but uh, at least the, um, the guerrilla warfare element of it has largely dissipated and it has become more of a conventional type of conflict, which I would not have predicted. But goodness knows the situation generally for, for Ethiopia uh, as a country has, has, has gotten worse. 
Ambassador David Shin, I'd like to give you the final word. Well, I enjoyed uh, chatting with you, George. You obviously had uh, a lot of good questions thought through, and and I um, I welcome that. Um, look forward to seeing whatever feedback uh, you get from your viewers. Um, I don't know where most of your viewers are located, for that matter. I don't know if they're if they're primarily uh, Eritrean or, or uh, Ethiopian or Horn of Africa generally. But uh, when uh, this this airs tomorrow, I'll I guess it will give some indication how many people have, uh, have watched it and maybe there will be some comment. Um, I usually get a fair amount of negative comments, so I'm used to that. Uh, we'll see how it, uh, how it goes. Ambassador David Shin, thank you. Thank you, George.